Es freut mich, dass gerade das Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to see that the clergy, uh, which usually does not uh, raise uh, such intensive discussions, actually did so in the late afternoon. But let us move on to the next um, item on the agenda. You know that there are people who actually read Clausewitz, uh, those who quote, those who um, study him, and there's certainly one person who actually did all three of them. He read Clausewitz, understood him, and um, also analyzed him. And uh, I'm sure he will give a very interesting presentation. You have the floor, sir. Well, talking about Clausewitz here is carrying calls to Newcastle. But Mr. Peitzel has been careless enough to call me and said he needed something about Clausewitz, not just a quote on Clausewitz and whether I could uh, do that. And then two weeks ago, I sat down and wrote uh, down a new notes based on what we used to teach. I think uh, we heard uh, one of my disciples this afternoon. Now, let us try to say a bit more about Clausewitz, Clausewitz and the word Let's uh, try to say more than the quote given by Mr. Kujat and others here, because I think I can safely say that when I prepared this conference, well, I'll do this quickly. So I took the Dümmler edition of Clausewitz, and then I looked up Will, and then I found that in Dümmler there are three quotes with the will. And what you know is no longer contained in the Dimmel edition. And that maybe is not really doing justice to what we are trying to do. Now let's try it anyway, because as we will see, this is not a problem of Clausewitz, that he had not identified will as an important component, but it is a problem of the editor. The editor has failed to see that will occurs in at least 40 places in Clausewitz's work. The word alone, will. So the word alone, will, occurs 40 times. And is already on the first page of the work about war in the introductory definition. So at the very beginning, he quotes that or is therefore an act of violence to force the enemy to fulfill his will. So this is quoted in Dimmler. So put differently, and uh, quote, war is therefore an act of violence to force the enemy to fulfill our will. And the former quote was, everyone seeks to force the other to fulfill his will by physical force. So this distinction between physical violence as the means and that's another quote. And to enforce your will on the enemy, uh, being the end, this is fundamental for the whole work of war, of Clausewitz. So it's in the first 10 lines. So this is fundamental knowledge. And this is followed by the well-known three observations, which are determined by interaction. So in the case of violence, Clausewitz distinguishes between hostile feelings. And here we have to get used to these different words being used by Clausewitz for will and hostile intentions. And he continues to say, if war is an act of violence, it necessarily belongs also to the mind, not will, but the mind. Now, in the goal to make the opponent defenseless, secondly, means that the opponent has no other chance than to fulfill our will. He emphasizes that war is not an action, is not an action. No, let me start again. So it is emphasized that war is not an action of a living force on a dead mass, but it is always the thrust of two living forces against each other. The consequence being that this latter goal, to make the opponent defenseless, always has to be thought 
of by both sides. So it's the interaction, as Mr. Patchell said it. So the effort, which is uh, the third element of this interaction, the effort of one's own forces is to be measured based on the resistance of the opponent. So these two forces are each a product of the two factors that are inseparable. So the size of the available resources and the strength of willpower, end quote. So these available means can be clearly determined, and here I'm no longer quoting, a quote I will tell you. So the, the strength of willpower can only be estimated roughly according to the strength of the motive. Now, when it comes to these descriptions, the definition of will evaporates step by step from the mind to the less calculable strength of willpower, while the concept of the term itself is always uh, being, being put in more and more precise terms in theory. So this current contradiction is deeply rooted in Clausewitz's approach to war and strategy. And in the following shed some light on wars, we will always have to consider this because what this means for strategic thinking is that the desired effect of an ever clearer clarification of the terms, the terminology used in this, or the facts of strategy is thus unmasked, exposed as an illusion. And this brings us to the letter eta, the Greek letter that we talked about. So from the very beginning, this is also part of Clausewitz's thinking. Now, for the product of resistance from the size of the available means and the willpower, what this meant for both warring parties equally, not the will and thus man in his imperfect organization always remains behind the line of the absolute best, unquote. So Clausewitz explains that this is the basis of the description of will. This is nothing abstract or logical, but, and I quote, it makes itself known what it will be tomorrow based what it was today. So this differentiation of time is not merely a helpful construct of thought and is not from our days, but according to Clausewitz, as a phenomenologist, it's a true objective reason of uh, moderation. Now, the transition from the abstract to modifications in reality takes place in what we today refer to as free will or the freedom of will, because the necessary degree of the effort of will is very difficult to achieve because of it, since human will never gets its strength from logical subtleties. So according, according to the assessment of the will in the strategy, it's based on the fact that it can only happen based on the data on which the phenomena of the real world uh, are based, according to the laws of probability. And thus, Clausewitz in the first 10 lines of the first chapter of the first book, so at the very front, in these very abstract considerations and deliberations on the basis of the interaction, he considered the power of the will as a strategic and generic term. In a more central, more specific, and more concentrated way than in his introduction to the work from Krieger of War, this can hardly be associated with strategy, and all of this was overlooked by the editors and publishers. So the fundamental ideas are now put into concrete terms in the following 13 paragraphs in the first chapter of the first book. So different concepts and terms come up that take a look at uh, will from a different angle. So it is firstly the political purpose that is considered as the original motive. Second. The standstill and the act of war and the actual duration of an act of war are based on the inner reasons and based on the weaker motives of action. And thirdly, 
Our chance, our luck, or the fortune, or the subjective nature of war challenges the forces of the soul, such as courage, but also uh, daring and trust in luck, boldness, and audacity. And in paragraph 23 of the first book, the will is emphasized as a leading form of intelligence in the form of political purpose. So the will is thus described by the terms motive and reasons, subjective nature, and forces of the soul. But these extensions of the understanding of the will cannot provide the desired specification of will in war. So this contradiction is also shown in the summary of the first book, in the two metaphors of the true chameleon and the miraculous trinity. And you have to understand this the right way. So it's a maximum of clarity that is clothed in a metaphor. And it's not uh, the deriv derivations that others are making. So in the following chapters and books, further derivations of the will are made. And we must bear in mind that Clausewitz thought about this 200 years ago. And he wrote 200 years ago in science and its current ramifications and sophistication wasn't even rudimentarily thought out. And this must be clearly emphasized here. Clausewitz's general categories of thinking were, from today's point of view, surprisingly modern. And this becomes most evident in the case of the will of the individual soldier all the way to the commander, the general. And this is why I dare to also of a classification according to today's scientific approaches to create a better understanding of further explanations. Or we can partly rely on Clausewitz's own categorization when he talks about the main moral potencies. So the will is now differentiated based on a more, on a wider sense of what will connotate. I will turn this into six different chapters. First, uh, the will in terms of the talent of the general. So Clausewitz uh, treats this particularly um, based on the uh, individual psychological point of view by the war genius. And deep insist in the following five chapters all the way to the topic of the iron will in connection with friction. So even if the thoughts of these chapters are often based only on the warlike genius of the commander, and Clausewitz himself in the course of his deliberations focused on the commander and statesman, but we must not overlook the introductory sentence in the third chapter of book one, which says, every particular activity requires, if it is to be pursued with a certain virtuosity, it requires peculiar, peculiar mind and spirit. Where well, these are distinguished to a high degree and are represented by extraordinary achievements, the spirit to which they belong is referred to as a genius. And this is where the genius comes in first. So Clausewitz is concerned with the energy which calls it action. And it describes this with terms such as thirst for fame and honor, firmness, steadfastness, self-control, and balance. And he looks at this in more detail using the more common term coup d'oeil, French term coup d'oeil, and explains this by means of the determination, the fast and appropriate decision, presence of mind, and the same force of the will and combines this with the courage and responsibility. And apodictically, he then states that a strong mind is one that does not lose its balance even in the most violent perturbations. And then again, he summarizes, one might regard all of these utterances of heroic nature as one of the same force of will that is modified according to the circumstances. And this is shown in the alloy of mind and intellect, uh, consisting of determination, firmness, steadfastness, and strength of character. And then he emphasizes that with all of these movements of his mental powers, it is especially important.
important to keep a balance or stay centered. And from these pictures, he develops a, a psychogram for the military leader and commander based on the differences in mind and character. This sounds very modern. All of this conveys the impression of a more static understanding of emotional forces. But on the one hand, he also comes to speak of the responsibility of the actor, not only for his own person, but also as a leader towards his subordinates. For example, when there's a loss of means and the power of resistance is tested, and this can lead all the way to disobedience. And the overall impression of all the dying physical and moral forces that uh, make his own courage no longer strong enough to revive the courage of all the others. And on the other hand, in connection with the uh, heat of the judgment, uh, he speaks of genius consisting of mind, which is equal to education, and mind in the form of courage to make a decision, determination, perseverance, boldness, and as one who has become, well, the well, the judgment of power, the exercise in the judgment of power, or war, warlike virtue of the army, together with boldness and perseverance. This happens from a socio-psychological point of view, and it becomes clear already in the initial chapter, chapter five, because of it says that the army's military virtue must lose the instinct for unbridled activity and power which it possesses in the, and subordinate itself to the demands of a higher kind, obedience, order, rule, and method. Enthusiasm for the cause gives uh, life to the warlike virtue of the army, but it is not an indispensable part of it. Psychologically speaking, that's very interesting. So this virtue or resonates in the chapters on friction. And in the final chapter of the first book, there's a culmination, the question of how the elements can be learned in the atmosphere of war and thus in aggravating circumstances. This is where the pedagogical aspect comes in. So the only means was to offer the army the habit of war and peace exercises were only a weak uh, substitute. So this esprit de corps could, but doesn't have to prevail. The less one can count on the individual character, the more this has to be replaced by the martial virtue. And this virtue could only come about during war and under great commanders, but then it could last for several generations. Clausewitz also speaks of an expanded and refined uh, gang spirit a scarred, hardened gang of warriors created by a series of happy wars and an army driven to utmost efforts. And instead, in longer periods of peace, order, skill, goodwill, certain pride, and an excellent mood can take their place, but they don't have an independent right to exist. And then the people's spirit of the army, so the people spirit of the army. And this is put in close relationship to the warrior virtues of the army. He briefly mentions it as the natural qualities of a people armed force, such as bravery, dexterity, hardening, and enthusiasm. And terms are used such as fanatical zeal, belief, and belief in the cause and opinion. He doesn't say more than that. But from the point of view of an organizational and sociological approach, his considerations can now also be associated with the statements made on the ends and means in war about the greatness of the war effort and also the influence of the political end on the war goals. Now, one example. A precondition for an opponent to be defenseless According to Gersowitz, this can be measured by a state, the armed forces, the country, and the will of the enemy. For him, there is no question that as long as the will of the enemy has not also been defeated, that is to say, his government and its allies have been signed 
have, have been uh, forced to sign a peace treaty, or as long as the people has not been subjugated, the uh, can reignite uh, and continue the, within the country, or maybe with the support of allies. So this has to be connected with the thoughts about uh, the art of war, and I quote, there are two things which in reality can take the place of the inability to resist further as a motive for peace. The first is the improbability. The second, that uh, sometimes the price to pay for success is too great. So you can see that in wars where one cannot make the other completely defenseless, the motives for peace will rise and fall on both sides based on the probability of a more distant success and the required effort to achieve the success. So today these are classic approaches for deterrence strategies. Will as the, as the people spirit from the point of view of the people, from the point of view of a political or cultural approach, political culture approach. So we must bear in mind that Clausewitz understood himself as a theorist and strategic thinker of the small war and insurrection. And he made a name for himself actually as a strategist of small wars. Nevertheless, the term folk spirit or people spirit has hardly any significance for his way of thinking about the war and strategy. Rather, he stresses that the character of the people must support the well, measure of the army. So Clausewitz is arrested in his thinking in his own century. So this folk spirit or the people spirit is only mentioned in connection with the main moral potencies. And then when it comes back to the subject of genius, a special warlike spirit is addressed, which, however, can only be found in the raw warlike peoples. So when in connection with boldness, there's also talk of the people's character, which constantly uh, interacts with the habit of war. So in case of the frictions, it is said that the spirit of the people can only be educated in war itself. And even though the then emerging term of national hatred uh, is introduced in the second chapter of Book Two. It, is, it then appears much later in the form of uh, the national power when today's wars are referred to. So such uh, thoughts on the people's spirit are most likely to be found in the form of the enthusiasm in connection with the people's armament in the sixth book, uh, all the way up to the social resistance of the people. This is where Clausewitz treats the people's war as an extension and a reinforcement of this whole process of fermentation, which we refer to as war. The new means which come to the fore were a consequence of the barriers of war. He's skeptical and fears that this new strengthening of the warlike element of humanity could be beneficial at all without reference to a standing army, he cannot even conceive of a people's war, unless in the sense of a crisis principle as a means of last resort of the state, and he then describes it with a quote, there's still time to die. Well, probably we couldn't say this today. So today's approach influenced by democratic societies can therefore still be expanded in his thinking. Now, fifth, the action theoretical approach can be found, even though in a simple form, as a strategic thinking in the entire book on Krieger. And simple or reduced means in contrast to the actual strategic thinking, which is dealt with in the next paragraph. Clausewitz used the term uh, of applied or higher tactics in his teaching of the crown prince. We heard a similar term today. So Kazuki uses the applied or higher tactics, and he differentiates this from strategy. So he divides tactics into two different types. On the one hand, the tactics uh, as a type of battle without concepts of the 
strategic connection to the whole, and the other is connected with strategic ideas because here the terms position, battle, etc. have to be understood in connection with the whole campaign. Now, this second form is what he refers to as higher tactics. Today, it is often referred to as an operation, in German at least, but I think it is strongly differentiated from the actual strategy. Kausewitz deals in detail with uh, the strategic will of generals, which uh, is based on a political purpose, first and foremost, and therefore it has to be taken into account first and foremost. But this political purpose is not a despotic legislator. So it has to bow to the nature of the means, and it is often completely changed by it. But it is always what has to be considered first. Politics, therefore, based on this purpose, will go through the whole act of war and exert a constant influence on it. Attention, and this is still the quote. As far as the nature of forces exploding within it allows. So let me repeat, politics, the political purpose is going to pervade uh, and will exert an influence as far as uh, the nature of the forces exploding within it allows or permits it. And this is where Clausewitz introduces almost uh, as an aside, uh, a thought that is typical of his thinking, and we find this in various places in a modified form throughout the book, that uh, in the nature of war there are forces that cannot be further influenced. He's talking about the nature of forces exploding within the war or pulsating forces or, or acting based on uh, aggravating means or aggravating elements, and also this uh, participating in space of the, of the battlefield. And there's also this conflict in which the nature of war stands with others' interests and the interests of individual human beings, so that war is like a contradiction in itself or half a thing. So according to Clausewitz, these are harmful effects. And Kasowitz's statement that uh, the will must submit to the nature of the means and is thus completely changed, but it must always be considered first. And he has put it like this uh, with intention. I mean, uh, deriving this from the primal laws of war in the sense of a top down approach even if Clausewitz was not familiar with the top-down approach, was hardly conceivable for him, because the image of the war as a machine, or the understanding of strategy as a scientific theory, was rejected by him. And therefore, the limitation of the will in the act of war in the title of chapter 6 in Book 8 is quite astonishing. War is a mere instrument of politics. It's amazing to the extent that Clausewitz doesn't want the instrumental or technical to be applied to war. And on the other hand, because this is exactly supported by the limiting of the will. So war from a purely military point of view, according to Clausewitz, is in inadmissible and harmful tries to resolve this by making the supreme commander member of the cabinet. And on the other hand, he blames politicians for such mistakes. And I quote, it is not this influence, but the politicians themselves that ought to be blamed. So to me, this reduction to politics doesn't go far enough, because history knows some examples of willless warfare, it's my concept, or well, to be liberated from, but maybe to be no longer bound by some higher norms. So to exclude such uh, possibilities of war would be reprehensible. 
They only focus on material aspects, while the whole act of war is permeated by spiritual forces and effects. So they only look at this one-sided activity, whereas war is a constant interaction of things that mutually influence each other. This principle from Book 2 on the theory of war is easily neglected in the area of strategy and higher tactics, but also in tactics in general. Sixth, will and the strategy in its own form, action in war is a duel. It's always a thrust of two living forces against each other. So what this means is human interaction. So Clausewitz speaks as one of the two pillars of the mind of acting as a living reaction and interaction, which strives towards its nature in all its uh, planning. And later he says that uh, the essential difference to other forms of human intercourse was that war is not an activity of the will that expresses itself against a dead substance or maybe against a living but nevertheless suffering object, but against a living and reactive one. That is the simple statement. The effect on the force of mind and spirit uh, have a constant uh, mutual interaction on both sides. So one's own will interacting with the opponent's will is not static. And here I have my doubts when it comes to discussions that sometimes we focus too much on will as a static matter. So Kasowitz says that he is always subject to the dynamic law of war with action and counteraction. The probabilities of real life, as he calls it. So this brings me to my last paragraph. This brings me back to my role as a teacher, as an educator. From the point of view of educational sciences, of course, the following question arises. What can be done to ensure that the strength of willpower can be developed as a reliable quantity as against the available resources, that it can be increased, maintained, and maintained um, in an effective way. Also, the proximity to Schleiermacher has been documented. Um, Clausewitz and his wife spent 13 years in Clausewitz, and they did have close contact with Schleiermacher. This has been proved. He knew his Schleiermacher, and uh, he also um, provided proof of it in his work. Clausewitz sees the main difficulty, especially for strategy, as for the tactics, to the peculiarity of hostile feeling, rational hatred, and the multiplicity of um, spiritual individuality. And uh, for this, he develops a wide variety of uh, pedagogical um, approaches. First of all, um, a reasonable view of the war and the form of study and reflection. And reflection is part of it, which needs to familiarity with the subject and fantasy uh, should also be mentioned here, which is seen as uh, something like practice and insight into the mind and um, exercise by using example f examples from the history. I must confess that I do have considerable concerns here because um, Clausewitz also saw great difficulties in this cumbersome representation of a historical event for teaching and uh, act so for producing evidence. Thirdly, or third um, possibility, the self-education or training of the future leader. I mentioned this before. A fourth, daily life, or to put it in modern words, socialization. Fifth, practical exercise of um, 
in the experience of peace, and this um, has to do with his knowledge of friction. He says this is necessary so that the mind may um, be accustomed to um, these situations and that reason may be accustomed to the appearances of war. This practical exercise by friction as a target of uh, learning subjects is uh, very interesting. And then six, the experience of war, even uh, this can only be achieved very rarely. Now, will is exemplified, is not really exemplified in these um, areas. Uh, can you still locate them there? After all, Clausewitz um, described um, the ability to think strategically as a productive ability, as teaching for use. He combined the various dimensions of learning, of cognitive, psychomotor, and affective, affective uh, aspects. He combined them into an alloy of mind and intellect. He said, the mind's reaction, the eternally changing form of things, makes sure that the um, acting person can carry the whole spiritual uh, form of his knowledge inside him. He is able to find the necessary decision in his own self. Knowledge, therefore, must be transformed um, with one's own mind and life, assimilated to one's own mind and life. So in 1830, Clausewitz um, understood today's forms of taxonomy and pedagogic um, um, aspect. And we now have to follow his path. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, you see, I did not promise too much. Professor von Rosen is one of the few people who actually read Clausewitz, understood him, and can quote him properly. So it's a rare phenomenon. Do take a close look at him. Now, this is a very philosophical topic, and we are going to um, add another element to this. We started with, with the military bishop. Uh, we moved on to um, the um, expert on Clausewitz. Uh, thank you very much, Professor. You really did a big favor here in my um, presentations. I often refer to these three qualities uh, of an officer Clausewitz mentions, the technical ability, then character, which uh, of course includes the virtues, and then an undefined third character. Um, Hartmann, in his book on general staff um, formation, mentioned this, but he didn't mention where in Clausewitz you can find this, knowing that his uh, doctoral father, uh, Professor von Rosen, had actually published his own book about this, um, and therefore it was available to posteriority, and I now received it and can now actually find the, the true basis of what I have been referring to for a long time in my presentations. So let's start with some questions from the audience. For the um, Clausewitz um, annual review, I'm, I've been looking for a, um, a paper which was part of Halvik's will, a handwritten form, uh, but it couldn't be found. I think your presentation would fit perfectly here. It would also be just the right, um, right length. We'll have to see what we can do. Dunke has also um, researched this. He says if uh, Clausewitz uh, would have lived for a longer time and managed to review his first book, um, all the examples may have been taken out. So the absolute war he tried to explain in his first book, if he would have reviewed that, um, we would have had many changes. Um, I'll be sure to link you up with Professor Donke so we can talk about this further.
Thank you, Baron von Rosen. I have one specific question. The problem of friction. I'm not sure I quite understood it. Friction in Clausewitz is actually just that. The friction which in the in planning processes or combat can develop. Now, if I understood it correctly, if you try to move and mobilize people for war, what is important is to remove friction. Friction between all those who are involved in war, and this also includes planning of the reserves that are not yet where they are going to be needed, because something did not work out in the planning or because of environmental conditions. So could you maybe touch upon friction and about what he really means? I just presented my own opinion, but I'm not sure if I'm right. I'm afraid I cannot agree with you. Klausowicz said, and I agree with him, or actually he used the word friction, Sometimes, and then he uses the plural frictions. And so you can say the frictions are at the tactical level down there. Still higher up, you still have the general friction. It was a, use, a word which was used quite a lot at the time. And it's just that it's this kind of abrasion or attrition. It's friction in the machine. And what he's trying to do is to explain what it is that can be the general who just doesn't have the right intention and is guided by fear. It can be the fog, it can be the private uh, who doesn't um, guide his horse in the right way. It can be all sorts of things. Of course, if you know, it can be the commander. He'll try to make sure that you keep the commander from being afraid. And still, you even may have a situation in which the commander, the general, may not be able to stick to his plan. So friction is what you have in the whole system of war. It can't be removed. It can be mitigated. That's the most you can do. Are you happy with my reply? Um, of course, you asked us to light the fire. I will not do that. I just have a very stupid lay question. You referred to the um, contact uh, uh, which he had with Schleiermacher and also Hege, Schlegel uh, lived at the same time. Kant and Kant lived before his time. Schopenhauer followed at the later stage. Uh, my question refers to the language of the Romantic era and the mm, language to use to assess the Rom German Romantic literary area. Can it be used to explain Clausewitz? Thank you for this question. It's um, quite interesting, yes. Kiesewetter was um, the philosophy teacher of Clausewitz. He was a direct pupil of Kant. And Clausewitz um, uses some of the terms used by Kant, um, and they go back to what he learned from Kiesewetter. Hegel, let me say that much. The reference to Hegel in the beginning of the 1930s, which is when it was found, he and his dialectics. If you read the Hartmann's book, book on pedagogics in Clausewitz, 
There will be no proof of it. And Hegel is in Schleier's dialectic are very different. So it's definitely Schleiermacher we find in Clausewitz. It's not like um, Kanto who goes from divide to divide. It's quite the opposite in Schleiermacher. But of course, if he's he likes Schleiermacher, he would have liked the other people from his age, other Greeks as well. Whether he actually read um, authors of the German Romanticism, I don't know. Uh, his wife was also a well-educated woman, but the, the, the big era of the Salonier, the um, woman intellectuals in the German Romanticism, um, I don't think, however, that his wife was a Salonier. So I don't think there will be a major influence there, but you can always try. Um, we can meet, and uh, I can look up what I have in terms of Salonier literature. We may be able to find something there. Professor, thank you very much for this excellent presentation. Thank you also for the interesting questions. And as regards the latest question, please turn to the, um, uh, the University of Philosophy. He also thinks that um, Clausewitz was a follower of Kant and Hegel. Uh, could you please ask the brigadier to move the microphone closer to his mouth? We can hardly understand him here in the booths. So there may may have been some influence. Thank you again, Professor. Wir dürfen in unserem Programm gleich weitergehen. Let us now move on to the next item and let me introduce Professor Beck of Vienna University. We try to have an ascending order as regards the topics um, presented. I met uh, back at the Austrian Forum Alpbach uh, when he presented. He was a presenter one of the breakout uh, sessions, and I think he fits quite well here. Professor Beck is uh, open for discussion. I'm sure he will provoke some questions in a positive um, meaning. And uh, back in Alpbach, I realized that many people didn't, weren't really able to follow his very um, detailed philosophical and religious um, explanations. I think in our circles, so the situation is quite difficult. I'm quite sure we have an expert audience here which can follow the professor's explanations. You have the floor. Thank you. Here we have the presentation. I have to admit that I don't know anything about the military. I did my military service in Germany, and um, we had, of course, conscientious uh, objection to military service uh, or to war service, as it was called in Germany. And I, I don't object to war service, but to uh, military service. Now, unfortunately, I only um, managed to get here this afternoon, so I don't know what you discussed before. What I would like to talk about is the basic question of what do we want to defend and why are we the way we are? And also with regard to China, you probably heard the news in China, people are being increasingly monitored in a totalistic way. So it's not about protecting our external borders only with the process, but it's also about the fact that many of our problems can only be solved in a global way. The Internet as part of it. I just had a seminar on artificial intelligence. I did with medicine and pharmacology, and then, uh, pharmacology and then also added theology 
and theologic ethics. And I also gave lectures on this, uh, also medical ethics in Vienna and in Innsbruck. And never dealt with um, military questions. Uh, Professor Schockenhoff, a colleague in Germany, wrote a book about um, peace ethics. You will find a lot of things about the just war. I'm not an expert on this, so I will just make some general considerations, and I won't mind if you decide to leave early because I've had a long day. I'd uh, like to touch upon how our values have been developing. I've often been in schools lately um, as regards education and ethics uh, in schools. I also listened to what the bishop said. My approach is quite a different one when it comes to asking uh, what are we, why did we become, how did we become what we are and why. So, what is the background of our values? I'm just referring to Europe. I probably include the United States because it's a young continent. The ethic, uh, ref basic ethics reflection and considerations were made in Europe in Greek philosophy. Most of all, I will um, speak about Aristotle, who found himself in a similar situation we are in it, he asked, but what is the link, what is the glue in a state? And we can ask the same question for Europe. And he had quite an obvious idea. He said it's about peoples are the glue in a nation. They bring a state to life. And he asked, what are people looking for? And that's the general question we have to answer in our personal lives, but also in society. He says people are looking for luck for happiness for a successful life. I was working in psychiatry for a time. No one wants to have a failed life. No one wants to be unhappy. And this shows us something about the structure of our world. Man is always aspiring towards the positive. There's no other way, of course. There are different definitions according to the culture you come from, and I would like to look at our own culture here. And then religions have been a um, source. I am not going to talk about Islam today. Maybe I will just make a comment or two. In Judaism, we have the question of the image of God. Man is the image of God. And then Christianity and the question of freedom. This is something that started in Judaism. And has been uh, continued in uh, Christianity, the internal autonomy, um, freedom, Kant, and then European Enlightenment, which made a big fundamental contribution to the development of our um, values. And then I'm trying to um, conclude by um, inspiring many questions on your side. So let's start with Aristotle and his philosophy, I can only give you a few bits and pieces which played a major role in the development of our Aristotle asked, what is it that moves man inside? As I said, man is aspiring to achieve the good. He wants to have a successful life. Only the psychopath in psychiatry will destroy his own life in part. Um, he has a destructive um, tendency, but that's uh, pathology in general. Man is uh, aspiring to truth more than towards lies, to justice and injustice. And he probably uh, would aspire to peace more than aspiring to uh, war. And this applies to family just as it would apply to people's family. And this was the basis of um, the big the first big um, book of rules, the, the Nikian ethics. Nowadays, it's important to look at the, the most recent developments in technology. Uh, in philosophy, it's quite the other way around. It's better to look way back, and the ancient Greeks provide better solutions. Then virtues, um, how does man go on to be happy by developing internal and external norms, um, the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not murder, and then internal um, attitudes, which then will develop into action. So man starts from the inside, and what's in me will be visible on the outside. 
and uh, he then developed four virtues. Um, virtue in German is quite an old word, uh, word. It means being able to lead your life. And I think uh, we need to um, use all forms of philosophy to teach some of these fundamental things to our young people. I'm much in favor of ethics as a subject in school, and uh, I think we should always have religious advices in politics as well in order to be able to know what the Buddhists, what um, Christians, what the Jews think about the various basic questions in life, so as to be able to understand what people do or think. So Aristotle is asking about these four main virtues, wisdom, justice, courage, moderation. Let's start with wisdom. Whatever you do, do it wisely and consider the end. Quid quid agis, prudenter agis, and respite finem. I would um, um, advise economists, but also politicians, to do the same. Um, very often, thinking is not very long, um, not a very long term uh, thing. I'm a member of the Ethics Commission in the Federal Chanc Chancellery. Um, it's important to think in the long term sustainable thinking, um, which comes, the word comes from uh, forestry. We have to think in the long term. Uh, it takes a long time for a tree to grow. We are realists. We know that the world is spinning fast. But still, we have to keep the overall aspects in mind. So we have to think of these sustainable long-term aspects. It's increasingly difficult because there are many short-term changes. Uh, we are always online. We can be in, in China in a second. And this was quite an interesting experience for me, Professor Matzner, Professor of Labor Legislation. He was a colleague in the Bioethics Commission. Uh, I sent him an email and I will you join us uh, for the meeting tomorrow? And he answered, after one section, I'm in Beijing. And this shows us that we are really um, at the same, we are, we're really at the same place at the same time nowadays, um, irrespective of where you are in the world. And big topic, um, justice, uh, you could have, an own, uh, have a specific talk about this. Um, in the ancient times, it was about transactional justice, about fair trade, basically, fair business. If not, we will have injustices and imbalances which can lead to war. One of the main problems we have today is the following. We're happy to have our computers, to have our projectors. What do we need for that? We need rare earths for that. We don't have them in Europe. China has them. Um, there are some rare earths in Northern America, of course. The big problem for the Americans, if they raise um, uh, raise taxes and the likes, is that the Chinese will not provide them with rare earths. And so there will be these wars for resources, for um, water, for earths. What about um, blackouts? I'm just uh, coming back from a seminar. Uh, um, ethics in natural sciences. Um, Austria has a water. We talked about um, the nuclear bomb, about questions of energy generation and rare earths as well. And uh, my colleague, a chemist, uh, showed maps on where you can find rare earths in the world. So the question is, how do we trade? Uh, Europe only has uh, intellectual assets. We don't have a lot of uh, material resources. We hardly have any rare earths. Or petrol. We're a small continent, however, with many languages, a long uh, tradition, and this was compact into an intellectual asset. Not that others don't have the same thing, but I think um, we are a kind of a predestined continent here. And so if we don't act on the basis of Christian um, impulses, we should apply pragmatic reasons, at least, uh, in, in with poverty. I always tell my medical students this, 
if you don't act out of um, Christian motives as uh, regards the cleaning personnel who will clean your operating theater, be pragmatic because they will have to clean your operating theater and if they don't, then you will have infections in the knee of your patient and that can then be passed uh, or that can be applied to the world as well. If it's not for Christian motives that we want to take care of poor countries and poor people, uh, we should use pragmatic reasons because if we don't take care of this problem, then they will um, come to Europe. So it really pays off. I have many African students. We have to act in our own interest here and try to ensure fair distribution when it comes to all the um, assets we have in the world. We have to close the gap between rich and poor. This is both true for domestic uh, situations and for um, the world. So this is also working for peace. And the third aspect uh, is uh, maybe the, the first step to um, further Christian virtues, justice. Justice means to tolerate things in the others which I may not like. Some time ago, I talked to a Jewish rabbi. I said, you as a Jew, you don't believe that the Messiah has arrived yet, but if you walk around and you can see Christian churches, don't you think that it's all rubbish? And then we briefly thought about this, and then said, yes, Professor, you're probably right, but if you believe in this, then we're fine in tolerating this. Oh, even though it is rubbish, uh, it is still tolerated. But for that, you need to know a lot. And this is what I would like to point out at the end of this short presentation. We don't really know enough about our culture. We don't know enough about Christianity. We don't even know who we are. And this is why Muslims don't want to discuss with us. Let me be concrete. A lot of Muslims are saying those are the Kufar, they believe in other gods. So, can you explain about the Holy Trinity? This is not a theological lecture, but it's politically quite uh, explosive. So, you don't need to become religious after this presentation, but our idea of freedom is linked to our relig religion. So, swim quickly and treat the same, the same and the things that are unequal need to be treated unequally. So it's not about the marriage for all, but in our culture, and the Chinese would see this different, we say everybody has the same human dignity, but of course a child will be treated differently than an adult man or woman. So we are equal in terms of human dignity, but not equal in terms of how we deal with them. It's a fundamental principle of justice that still applies. Now, courage, that comes from the military. Aristotle says that courage is the right balance between cowardice and foolhardiness. So the coward soldier, he remains uh, hidden in the trenches. But the foolhardy heroes, they run out and they want to die for their fatherland. And the courageous ones, they overcome their inherent uh, but they're not foolhardy. They don't run out blindly from the trenches. They think in a clever way. And this virtue of justice is uh, uh, this uh, virtue of uh, bravery is coupled with moderation. So this Zotis teaching of Aristotle, so moderation is about the right balance. So we don't only need the middle ground, we need ethical elites too. It's finding the right balance between two extremes. So the right balance between two extremes. So medicine would say the right dosage, not too much, not too little, so the right measure. And that needs to be transferred to also the virtue of bravery or courage. So stand up for something, not don't turn it into extremes so that this doesn't turn into a new conflict. So that is the origins coming from Greek philosophy, which is important for our context. Now, 
We'll continue with Roman philosophy. Just one comment on that. A comment on that. Cicero, in his book *The Republic*, about the state and the offices, about the obligations of politicians, is the concept of human dignity. But this concept of human dignity is still something that is conveyed. So, if somebody holds a high office and if uh, he has merits, then we would say a dignified person. And in the Catholic Church, we also have the highly dignified cardinal. So it is the office that you hold that uh, dignifies you. So we've overcome this today, but anyway, that was the idea in the Roman state with Cicero. So this dignity is gradual and graduated, and it's uh, something that you can forfeit or lose. And we still have some of that today. I don't know whether you followed this a couple of years ago. The German president, Christian Wolf, died for corruption, allegedly. So he was invited to the Oktoberfest, and he paid 700 euros for his hotel or whatever. And the German president, when he retires, is entitled to uh, not a pension, but a remuneration of honor. That's how it's called. And they discussed whether he lost his honor because he was invited to the Oktoberfest, and will he still be entitled to receive this uh, pay of honor? So you can acquire honor, but you can also forfeit it. You can lose your honor if you misbehave. Now let's move on in history from Judaism. Well, we come to the theological aspect. So man created an image of God, and this is important for our context of the military protecting our borders and defending freedom. This is really important. Now, when you take a look at the history of religion, you don't have to be a believer, but the philosopher Hegel said man has always been oriented towards the absolute. I can't really explain this at length. But maybe otherwise he couldn't identify the relative, the finiteness of our life, of the world. So we've always been aiming for the absolute. Now, what is the absolute? There can be fate, can be lots of gods, like in India. I worked in Indian hospitals a lot. Hinduism, there could be there many gods in Greek or Roman philosophy. Coming from Hinduism, Buddha said it's all rubbish, all these many gods, Buddhism, a religion without God. And now comes the decisive uh, change and transition that is important for our continent. And that happens quickly. So Judaism assumes that the God of Israel, Yahweh, has shown himself out of his own free will. So the old images of God, well, the philosopher of Bible said there was a projection, a human projection. So we project deities and then we can sacrifice to them. And we hope that they will look down benignly on us. But Judaism says that God is not invented by people, but it really exists. So the Maya, to name it, he says, I am here. I exist. The existence of God is created by God himself. Now that's a change of paradigm. And now this God is doing something. He acts and he leads the people of Israel from slavery into freedom. This is highly important for the debate around freedom in eternity. The God of Israel is a liberating God. He was an oppressed people in Egypt, and then at the time of Jesus by the Romans, and then by many other peoples. So they were always oppressed. But their God is saying, I see your suffering, I want you to be free. So the Hebrew word for this is dabar, God speaks and acts. So dabar means to speak and to act. So he speaks to the people of Israel and frees them from the slavery in Egypt. And this leads to the next ethical phenomenon, the Ten Commandments. The preamble to the Ten Commandments is, I, your God, have freed you from slavery of Egyptians. Now, if you don't want to lose this freedom anymore, don't pray to false gods. 
You should not kill, steal, lie, or have the Ten Commandments. It is uh, to free people, make sure they don't fall back to the old dependency and servitude. So ethics as an external norm, as, as Aristotle put it, is inner attitude, but now also the external norms. Why should you not do those things? Well, in, in order not to lose your freedom anymore. So, <laughs> and it says explicitly you should not kill, should not murder. Murder has a negative connotation, even from the legal point of view. But there are exceptions to the ban on killing. The police has to kill, soldiers unfortunately also have to kill. Legitimate defense, defending oneself, but murder, murder has a certain intention. So. Clean motive. So, thou shalt murder. Don't do this, or else you might lose your freedom. I know this Hebrew word dabar, the speaking and action, logos in Greek. This is not a religious or theological lecture, don't worry. So, Christian philosophy believes that this logos becomes man. That's what we celebrate uh, at Christmas. So, in German, it's Bird, the word, but it's not a logic, of course, it's a human one. And now Christianity brings it from the external liberation of people to this inner liberation of every individual. So basically what psychoanalysis is trying to do, so free people towards their own autonomy. So a deeply Christian endeavor. My last book is called What Makes Us Free, The Ethics of Liberation, the Ethics of Self-Realization. What are we here to do? We should well, self-realize each one in his own way. In this Judean Christian tradition focuses on the uniqueness of people. And the Chinese philosophy doesn't have that at all. Why? It goes well with communism. So the image of man coming from philosophy and from religion characterize our political system. The idea of freedom, trying to live in democracy has something to do with our philosophical and theological traditions. So Christianity, Paul said that uh, everybody is uh, equal in front of God, before God all men are equal, so in Christ all one, like, so uh, Jews, and Greeks, and slaves, and uh, free men, but all are the same. So it's about the inner liberation of man, people want to be respected for their own sake, you know, loving yourself, loving your enemy, even you should love the enemy or respect them for their own self. That's the highest ethical paradigm. Well, this is how it turned out for Christianity as well. So uh, love of yourself, love of your enemy, love of your neighbor. And then Trump has uh, strikes of retaliation, Iran, overcoming this idea of retaliation. Turn the other cheek. You can only do this individually. You can't really do this at a political level. It's true, but still, overcoming the idea of revenge, one eye is taken for an eye, you will do unto you. So in Judaism, this is a limitation of the use of violence, but in Christianity, we need to overcome this idea of taking revenge. This is done politically, it's another matter. You can't simply disarm and say the Russians are going to come down at some moment. No, I think we need the balance of power. Something strange happened to the nuclear bomb. The terror of the nuclear bomb created peace. So for 50 years we've had peace. So how this is done is another matter. But overcoming the idea of revenge, retaliation is important. And one more comment, and I'm already coming to end very soon anyway. Why is it so important, uh, this trinity? Well, it has something to do with freedom. If there is absolute out there, then what is it? Is it love, justice, is perfection? Well, if God is perfect, he doesn't need anything. So this is why Trinity is so important. So this image of God, well, God is, suffices unto himself. So the identity and, and difference. So God is enough uh, to himself. He doesn't need the world. The world 
contribute to the happiness of God. So if he creates the world, it is uh, for the world to be free. So the concept of freedom of the Israeli people and also in Christianity. And we did discuss this with Muslims, whether their image of God, the logos of God, we are saying, has been incarnated, embodied by Jesus Christ. But the Muslims are saying that the logos, the word of God, has been uh, illiterated in the letter of the Quran. These are fundamental differences that we need to discuss. So the question is, is Quran able to engage in democracy? Is a certain image of God capable of having a debate about freedom? We're not even at the beginning there. Our minds at a major meeting a year ago because the Germans now want to come up with a new law on Islam. These very questions were discussed there. Well, I'm not going to discuss this here would be the subject of entire Congress. But the Christian image of God, unity and diversity, presupposes the plurality of the state and the idea of freedom and anticipates the question of how to deal with your fellow human being overcoming the idea of retaliation and revenge. Now, the Middle Ages, Pico de la Mirandola, who deals with the question of the freedom of will, your topic, strategy and will, the animal, follows its instincts, but human beings are free. They can either follow their instincts or not. So we can have a hiatus. So think before you follow on your instincts or urges. So then modernity, the subject, Dürer paints his self-portrait, the Reformation, Luther. So where does this take us to Immanuel Kant, enlightenment, liberation, on this self-inflicted immaturity. This is directed against Christianity, maybe even against the Catholic Church. Don't oppress people. And the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, those are Christian values. But even in France, are they still tied to the reason for this freedom? But this is not our topic here. So Kant comes to the conviction that people are unique. He uses concepts from Christianity that don't exist in it, but wants to keep a philosophical reflection. You know the categorical imperative, only uh, act only on the maxim by which you can at the same time want to become a general rule. So the golden rule is what you don't want others to do unto you, don't do it to anybody else. So if you don't want people to do that to you, don't do it to anybody else. And what's more important are the next two concepts, and this brings me to the conclusion. What is the central difference between dignity and value? So in the realm of end, everything has a price or a dignity. What has a price can also be replaced by something other an equivalent, which on the other end is above all price, therefore does not have an equivalent, it has dignity. So I have to be practical, so things have a value. This is a glass that costs one euro. If I break it, I'll buy a new one. So it has a price and can be replaced by something equivalent. But if a child is born, falls off the table, and dies, it would be cynical to tell the parents, well, why don't you make a new one? Well, people cannot be replaced. They cannot be substituted. They're unique. They don't come at a price. They can't be sold. Overcoming slave trade or trade in organs. You can't sell organs. So that's uh, overcoming this uh, concept of Cicero of dignity. So this is inherent. Inherent in man. Man should be respected for his own sake. And this is different from value. We are talking about the values of Europe. Actually, value comes from the economic realm. What is it worth? What price does it have? So things have a relative value. And um, reasonable people are called persons because uh, this is the self, uh, the purpose in and of itself. Uh, you should. Uh, Oh, respect people and love your neighbor, love your fellow human being. So I asked the Japanese, is it true that you don't have the concept of a person? Yes, well, how do you tell your girlfriend, I love you? He said, we can't do that. And I said, how do you say it? He said, and we say, there's love in the room. So it's not like you and me, but there's love in the room. So all of philosophy 
thrives based on these concepts. A sinologist says that what we visual is an achievement of Christian Judean tradition. It doesn't exist in China. It would be almost impossible for one person to stand up and speak out against the scientific community and say, I see this differently. In China, you need to subordinate yourself, not disrupt harmony. This is why it goes well with communism. And now artificial intelligence, how people are surveilled. Increasingly, we have to be really careful. We have to defend our image of man, which means that the intimacy, the privacy, is to be protected. And not everything should be seen by everybody. We shouldn't let artificial intelligence monitor us all the time. So let's leave this out, and I'll come to the conclusion. Does this mean in concrete terms, this concept of dignity? Everybody is entitled to life, and the dignity of man is inviolable. You can't say two people who are dead and 500 people are dead, but anyway, this is what it is done in war. And Trump said 150 dead, it's a bit too many. So, and so human dignity is inviolable. That's what the human, uh, constitution says, the basic law, and also what the Lisbon Treaty also says the same. So there's a a restriction of the state authority after the Second World War. So the protection of dignity of man that's inviolable is a principle. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, this concept of uh, dignity of man was turned into human rights. So what should be different? Well, the uh, appreciation of the individual, respect for the individual, and freedom that we can freely say what we think. People in communism couldn't say that, so there's no freedom of opinion there. Then, uh, human rights, freedom of conscience, and the inner freedom of people to be themselves without being, uh, well, monitored by artificial intelligence, protection of privacy, and the creativity of man that we can unfold and develop. Four weeks ago, I was on Schloss Segau at a Congress, and I met a German lawyer who was uh, one of the people who drafted the General Data Protection Regulations. And he said something interesting. He said, Google my account, where you can see what kind of data Google has collected on you. And this is decisive. He said, Google also has made a profile for you. How you are probably going to be developing over the coming 20 years. You can have this deleted, of course, but if algorithms decide about uh, what we should do and what we will do and how we should react, the Chinese are already starting doing this. But we don't only have to talk about the freedom of our state that is to be upheld by military means, but also about our inner freedom that is threatened by many other things. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, just one thing which I forgot. Fight for resources, the rarers and the like, will be a problem which you also will have to consider in military terms. Thank you, that was all. Brigadier, please um, bring the microphone closer to your mouth. We can hardly hear you in the booth. Thank you for your presentation. Um, we will need some time to think about what you said. Uh, we will have to digest what you presented, but maybe there's an immediate question now. This has been a wonderful presentation. There's just one aspect which I don't quite agree with the Christian um, image and uh, the deterrent, the thought of deterrence by punish, punishment, uh, the capacity of reaction. So we take revenge with uh, the person or the, the actor 
who um, attacked us and uh, not just that very actor but the entire population. How can you explain this phenomenon? Well, you quite correctly um, mentioned this aspect. Uh, if you remember the, the mountain speech, um, blessed are those who provide peace. And we have had 70 years of peace because of uh, politics of deterrence. So the question is, what is the intention? Is it to maintain peace? And this will maybe require you to increase your armament? Or is my fundamental thought the thought of revenge? Which may be a motivation as well. And maybe still is. But in our context, the only intention for um, armaments um, process would be to cause peace. And peace in this um, system cannot be maintained by weakness, by, uh, but rather by strength. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the question of revenge. Um, I would see in a strange balance we have in this world. We need to acquire more weapons in order to keep peace. There can be the, the idea of vengeance as well. The one thing that's important for me is to uh, maintain peace. How you get there, the way you used to get there, is another thing. I would also like to thank you and have one comment. You referred to uh, Europe only. Let me start with Germany. We know that uh, we also had reunification, and now 30 years later, I think we still haven't quite unified or reunified. So based on the concept of will, how can we make sure that the, the language we use in Western and Eastern and Northern and Southern Germany, how can we make sure that Germany really becomes one unified country again. I think we'll need another three to four generations at least. It's my experience that um, these intellectual um, influences hold on for a long time. Uh, in the West, we have this um, system of freedom, which we always hold on to. Um, businesses, for example, which have this entrepreneurial initiative. In the East, they did not have this kind of initiative that uh, simply did not exist in Eastern Germany. They were just relying on the social system they had. Let's look at it from a theologian's point of view. 20 millions who uh, were never um, Christians so or no Christian value system. Then the wall comes down in 1989. And as a consequence, you still have a social uh, market economy, not capitalism. And now the economy, the economic power clashes with people, meets people who cannot deal with this kind of entrepreneurial approach. Then refugees, you don't have any refugees in uh, the former GD, um, GDR, um, but that's where AFD, the, the German right-wing movement, started. And now people have this sudden fear. 30 years ago, the wall came down. We're finally getting some kind of prosperity. And now all those refugees come along and want to take it away from us. Um, so it's the, these um, foundations of values, which were different in former Eastern Germany. They used to be communist, socialist, and now free market economy is brought into the country, and it's still difficult for them to um, adjust to it because it requires you to take initiative to be entrepreneurial. Um, my grand grandmother um, came to the West um, many decades ago, and she was completely confused uh, at seeing different prices in different shops. And, um, 30 years may have passed, but mentalities have not yet um, been unified. I don't think this will happen anytime soon. Last question, please. No microphone. Morgen früh noch.
Letztes Jahr hier hatte ich die letzte Frage gestellt an einen. Last year I um, had a question for an Israeli advisor about uh, government artificial intelligence. I asked him whether they had a discussion in their country about um, um, giving rights to robots. Um, we are thinking that the 50s of this um, century, um, robots could acquire a subjective kind of um, form. Can you say anything about this? Well, it would be a whole new conference. Let me just say three things. It's interesting that um, Saudi Arabia has given citizenship to a robot, a female robot, Sophia, um, which um, does not even have a veil. Interesting. Um, if you talk to lawyers, of course, it's always um, difficult uh, to define uh, things. Uh, we're speaking of autonomous and uh, driving. Autonomous is a Greek word giving yourself your own laws. That's what cars do, of course. I discussed this with philosophers, and to me, things are quite clear. If a computer has rights um, and um, and tasks, then, of course, um, what do you do if a car runs over a person? Will you put them to prison? It's always humans who are at the basis of everything in the end. Um, but lawyers said it's not quite that clear because you have uh, all the other questions uh, of liability and so on. Um, how can you assign these things to computers? They're quick at calculating, but they don't have no, they don't have any consciousness, and they don't know what they're doing in this sense. I know the discussion, but of course it's a crazy discussion because they'd have to build uh, prisons for computers. I don't want to disagree with your conclusions. I'm a social and uh, economic historian. And as regards um, personal freedom and uh, the fact that this um, definition is missing somewhere in a language. Now, in China, apparently, they say that there's no term for individual freedom and personality. This could be explained by the way that there are other reasons as to why social structures and governmental structures developed in the empire, which were different from uh, what was defined in Europe um, in the definition of the free individual. Maybe this simply was not possible. Just because uh, in Africa we don't have any Indo-Aryan languages, I would not say that Africans cannot have the feeling of individual human dignity uh, and of um, assuming that they can be individual people. Yes, you're absolutely right. Thank you for this additional comment. Let me just add one more thing. All our systems uh, of thinking, of course, are also used to, to tackle problems in our everyday lives. Thank you, Professor. Thank you again for your questions. And let me close with two thoughts I just came up with. First of all, I'm pleased to see that you also um, refer to this position of strength, especially with regard to Russia. The vacuum Europe has accepted vis-a-vis -vis Russia can uh, trigger aggressions which would not have been there without this vacuum. It's, uh, like uh, offering a piece of meat to a tiger. Of course, you shouldn't be surprised if the tiger wants to take the piece of meat. As regards artificial intelligence, um, we had a very interesting presentation by Professor Misman in Freifach one or two years ago. How do you find evil developments in computers by the fact that the computer tries to bite at the uh, the person um, writing his code or its code. I used to have a 
an old computer and there was a random function in the old computers which created a random value between 0 and 1. If you scale this, you can code simple programs in more modern systems. Uh, experts say um, random situations cannot be coded. If you tell the computer to do just anything, the computer will ask you, what should I do? And if you just tell him to do this, then he will do this 30,000 times. So it's quite a paradoxic thing, but the fact that we are so good at um, coding is probably a consequence of our inability to do certain things. We cannot repeat certain things, certain moves uh, for a thousand times. Computers can. Can I just add one thing to this? We had a conference on education with Professor Fassman, Professor Lisman, and others. And they all said a computer cannot uh, make any forecast in the future because freedom and um, chance play a role here, which is what computers can deal with. And Zuckerberg said himself that the problem wasn't that we on our data in Facebook. The problem was that behind my back, uh, our computers developed their own lives. They uh, looked at the Boeing um, crashes. The pilots tried to intervene 27 times. They, it just wasn't possible. A few weeks ago, there was an interesting conference in Vienna. Uh, I wasn't there. My colleagues um, told me that uh, five or six um, mistakes or um, wrong commands in a computer could um, lead to nuclear bombs to be triggered. So this is an interesting development. Um, God creates man, man becomes independent, um, man creates a computer, computers become independent. We also have an intellectual vacuum, and I think we need to reestablish an equilibrium. I think this is an important comment that we need to digest. I'd like to invite you for dinner now.